the most monumental shift in the history of philosophy is one that is the least known and the most misunderstood, Christianity. People with no knowledge of philosophy or theology are often, very sadly, the people who speak most on the subject matter. One can think of the likes of Sam Harris, Richard Dawkins, or Neil deGrasse Tyson as a few modern examples. But in philosophy and history, Christianity proved to be the most significant development in human consciousness, providing for the birth of the self and the philosophies of individuality that we have 2,000 years later. So how exactly did this happen? We previously examined how out of the Greek poetic tradition, the philosophic traditions of Platonism, Aristotelianism, and Stoicism all emerged. What united the Greek philosophies was their emphasis on understanding the outer world, their premacy of reason over love, of rational observation, instead of pathological eroticism. The erotic world was associated with Hesiod, Homer, and the playwrights, according to the post-Socratic philosophers. That was a world that ultimately led to violence, the irrational, and death and destruction writ large. But by observing the order and movement of the cosmos, the Greek philosophers asserted, we would realize the poets were wrong and could escape the chaos and the violence that contaminated us. By becoming one with nature, the nature we can observe, the triumph and freedom of reason could commence. Christianity ultimately rejected this view. By its own theology, it had to. God is not just truth and reason, as was the case in Greek philosophy. God was also and primarily love. God is love itself. Christianity, then, attempts to bridge the gap between rationality and love, this unresolved tension that was inherited from Greek philosophy, between the rational cosmos we can know and the human passions that stir and govern the human heart. You are probably familiar with this dichotomy. St. Thomas Aquinas, for instance, the most famous of the scholastics, giving all of his rational arguments for the existence of God and how we can know everything about the world. St. Thomas is very much part of the Aristotelian, the Stoic tradition of observing the world and giving rational arguments for what it is to live in conformity with nature. Then there are the Renaissance humanists, like Nicholas Cusa, turning our mind back to the human heart, to inner nature and the self, a celebration of human nature and human love, which led the Renaissance artists and their paintings and sculptures to inspire us to beauty even today. The history of Christianity oscillates between the celebration of God as reason, Thomas and the Scholastics, and the celebration of God as love, Dante and the Renaissance humanists. The one figure, though, who is the most important to the history of Christian philosophy is the man who influenced both the Scholastics and the humanists then even later the Protestant reformers, St. Augustine. For it was St. Augustine who declared in De Trinitate, on the Trinity, that the soul is, quote, the rational intellect. And the rational intellect in man was the image of God in us. But it was also Augustine who said the most radical statement in Western cultural and intellectual history one that we are still living in the aftermath of. Delectio Deus est. Love is God. Love is divine. In Latin, if you literally translated one word at a time, one word after the other, Delectio Deus est. Love, God is. In his homilies on the Epistle of John, Augustine extended the formulation of God is love, which is found in 1 John 4, 16, and then literally says that all love is divine, and wherever love is found, God is found. In the Confessions, he also famously remarked, I was in love with the idea of love. As we can now see, 
Augustine was obsessed with this concept and the idea of love. In the beginning, love created the heavens and the earth. That was Augustine's understanding of Genesis 1. Love is the beginning of everything, not chaos, not reason. Love, however, is also knowable. Knowable through experience, but not rational observation. We know love through the experiences we have with love, with the feeling of love. Love is not something that you can rationally observe. Love is not something so-called scientific. Love is experiential. Thus, with Augustine and the rest of Christianity influenced by him, Christianity becomes the philosophy of love, and the philosophy of love is found in people, in the human heart, and in our relations and interactions with others and the world. Christianity lays the seeds for the philosophies of existentialism, phenomenology, even psychology, since it is principally concerned with the world of human experience. This is the big revolution in Christian philosophy. Rather than look to nature to understand ourselves, as the Greek philosophers did, Christianity looked to the world of human experience to understand ourselves. The most famous question asked by Augustine in the Confessions was mihi questio factus sum, I have become a question even to myself. Augustine asserted many things in his life that are worth knowing, that God is an artist, that the cosmos is a poetic creation, that our souls are notes in the music of existence, all though are simply expressions of love. As Augustine goes on to say, love is the basis of all things. But in trying to understand the nature of love, the rational trying to understand the irrational, Augustine goes beyond the Platonism that saved him from Manichaeism. The Greek philosophical tradition, as we explained, ultimately looked outward for answers. Even Platonism, though it can be described as the philosophy of the intelligible world, which is why Platonism always had a closer relationship to Christianity than Aristotelianism has, looked outward to the realm of the forms beyond nature. Aristotelianism looked outward to the world of immediate nature, the material world we find ourselves in as imitative creatures of. Stoicism looked outward to the entire cosmos, recognizing that we cannot control the movement of the heavens, that everything was in flux, and that once we accepted this principle, we could conform to the movement of the cosmos and control our own passions, the only thing we have direct control over. Christianity's revolution in philosophy is ultimately the creation of the self, as William Barrett explained in his great book, Irrational Man. Why is this? Because Christianity, as we should hopefully now begin to see, turn inward and not outward for its answered. Rather than looking outward for God and reason, Augustine turned inward, looking to human experience, looking into the heart, into the soul, into the human mind. As he also famously said in the Confessions, when he discovered God, he discovered God within him. It was only after turning inward that love was found. Love was not a body to be found floating out in the universe. Love was intimately particular and inward and experiential. This is why even Slavoj Žižek explains Christianity and Augustine as the beginning of, quote, psychological interiority, and why other noted scholars and psychologists have said that the rise of modern psychology is Christianity without its concern for metaphysics. Reason itself, since God is reason, is also found within us. Reason doesn't exist in the realm of the forms as it does in Plato. Reason is found in our minds, for our mind is the soul and the soul possesses reason, a vestige ruin of the God who created us in love. 
Augustine explained this in De Trinitate, that the image of God in man is found in his mind. God is reason and God is truth, is to be found in the human soul and in human memory, the memory that makes up the castles of human consciousness. God is love and love is God, is also found in the human heart, as we've been explaining. Thus, to know reason and to know love, we must turn inward and try and unite the mind, which is the soul, and the heart, which is love. Thus, as you can see in Christianity, Christianity's rationalism, its understanding of reason, is not what we observe out in the world, but it is what we can come to know about our inward selves. Augustine, therefore, begins his wrestling with rationality and love, the two great poles that occupy Christian philosophy. Moreover, because humans possess rationality and are also erotic, loving animals, this tension between reason and love is the tension that defines human existence. And since love, God, is found in humans and not out there in the material world, Christianity primarily becomes concerned with the question of humanity rather than the question of nature. What does it mean to be human? We should now begin to see the dramatic turn in philosophy that Christianity begets. Plato looked to the realm of the forms, Aristotle to the material world all around us, the Stoics to the heavens. Augustine turned to himself, to us, to human beings. Christianity, as a result, looked to the answers of philosophy within human beings, in human actions, and what motivates them rather than the outer world of the universe and observable nature. As Hannah Arendt said of Augustine, he was the only philosopher the Romans ever produced. Why did Hannah Arendt say this? Because Augustine was unique, original, innovative. The other Roman philosophers like Cicero and Seneca were just Roman variations of Platonism and Stoicism. Augustine, Arendt reminds us, was a philosopher of the heart, of the will, thus beginning the entire tradition of philosophical voluntarism in the Western tradition, of which some of the more famous philosophers like Friedrich Nietzsche and Michel Foucault also belong. The inward turn to the self, the incurvetus in se, as Augustine would call it, is what would eventually lead to the proliferation of the liberal arts in late medieval Europe with the scholastics and the Renaissance humanists. The discovery or rediscovery of the classics told us about ourselves, which the scholastics endlessly poured over because these were works of the human heart and the human mind that we could unlock to learn about ourselves. The dialogue and engagement with Islam, one of the positive, if unintended, outcomes of the Crusades, caused the Renaissance humanists to look into their hearts and the hearts of Muslims to try and to discover the universal human nature that unites all human beings, regardless of religious confession and devotion. Christianity became the philosophy of the self, whereas Greek philosophy was the philosophy of the cosmos, of nature. Christianity gave us theories of the self, the soul, the body, sin, love, goodness, and sanctification. It also led to a new form of empiricism, radically different than the empiricism of the Greeks. In De Veritate, on truth, Saint Anselm declared that since God is truth, God could be known by human senses. Anselm turns the attention of human sensations inward to us rather than the material world. What a shocking surprise. He is not concerned with why the objects of the world move or sound the way they do. He isn't concerned with why certain things smell the way they do. He is concerned with the how and the why we interpret these sensations the way we do. 
sensations, although caused by the material world, are interpreted by us. Sensations are otherwise irrelevant without humans to experience and interpret them because Christianity is all about the philosophy of experience, of the self. If a tree falls in a forest and no one is around to hear it, does it make a sound? This is one of the silly questions of medieval philosophy, but now you can understand why it is actually asked. Christian philosophy isn't about the world, it is about us. So if we are not around to hear sounds, then sounds are an irrelevant subject matter. Doesn't matter if a tree falls and makes a noise because we aren't around to hear it. We are what matters, not the tree. Because of this, the true study of empirical science is actually a study of humanity. Humans do the interpreting. Can interpretations be wrong? Of course. Anselm tells his pupil in the dialogue that we can interpret sensations incorrectly. However, Anselm also asserts that this is a deficiency in human reasoning and not the senses themselves. This is why Christianity is ultimately skeptical of hyper-rationalism. It is not our senses and our experiences that are wrong. It is our interpretation of those senses and experiences that are wrong. Thus, it is our application of rationality that becomes improper, for it is through wrong reasoning that we reach wrong interpretations. But the senses themselves are always right. We smell, and the smell is real. We hear, and the hearing is real. Whether we smelled the proper scent or heard the music from the right direction didn't have anything to do with the senses, but how we interpreted them. The eye see, the ear hears, the tongue tastes. But whether we see properly or hear the music from the correct direction or whether the tongue tastes the correct ingredients is a product of rational interpretation. But to end with the summarizing of Christian philosophy and the revolution that it begat, God is reason and God is love. This God of reason and God is love is found in us rather than the outer world. Christianity creates the philosophies of the self, of inner subjectivity and inner nature. Christianity's concern is the self, that inner subjectivity and inner nature and inner consciousness that contains the residue of God, the image of the divine. The attempt to square the rational and the erotic is found, ultimately, in God. Without God, there is no rationality and no true love. There is only the irrational and the lustful. Christianity, then, attempts to bridge the gap between reason and love, the reason extolled by the Greek philosophers and the love sung of by the Greek poets. This is why Dante unites reason and poetry, love, in the Divine Comedy. It attempted to do so by not looking to the outer world, but the inner world, the inner world of human nature. However, Christianity's invention of the self, its concentration on human interiority, turned our attention away from the material world. The rise of modern philosophy with Machiavelli, Francis Bacon, and the so-called Enlightenment thinkers would rise in opposition to this insular philosophizing of Christianity. The end of Christian philosophy is marked by the rise of modern science, the philosophy of scientific conquest and investigation by Francis Bacon, and that is what we shall explore next. No longer would the world of philosophy be concerned with the questions of the self and inner subjectivity and inner nature, but with the material world and outer nature, the nature of things and objects, thus giving rise to the explosive revolutions of industry, commerce, and science, which define the modern world. The rise of practical philosophy is the next chapter in the story of philosophy.